Sorry, because there's a, I saw somebody come up with talking about something about Freya, and it just it kind of blows me away. And I'm going to talk about my thoughts on it and the reasoning behind it, because I don't think everybody quite understands what I'm talking about when I say that Freya is not Gullfett. There's always this huge backlash, and who are you to say that? You can't say that. Well, I, I take it out of the Lord. I'm going to tell you why I take it out of there, and then in the end, when we get done with all that. I'm going to talk about the image of what it should look like because we might sit here and study and talk and read and discuss all kinds of bullshit. But at the end of the day, <laughs> we got to know what that looks like. We got to know what it looks like. If we follow this kind of path, if we follow this train of thought, if we buy into this, because all of us come in here, made a decision, say, you know what? I'm going to go against the grain against the entirety of the world. And I'm going to start following these old gods because, well, I think I know something. And um, it's a real struggle for everyone's ego that comes in on something like this, because there's a real risk that what the, what if we're wrong? What if we're wrong in everything we do? What does it look so? So when you get down to brass tacks, when you look at what the academics are doing, when you look at what all these other people are, really studying the root cause of that is 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 we've made a pretty radical decision and quite frankly we're the only examples for most of our families we're the only examples that any of our families will ever see of what it means to live this kind of life and that's a real issue so if we're if we're wrong because there are everything we every misstep that's made every wrong thing that's said what defense do we have other than understanding this academic background and understanding, well, this person read this and this might really actually, you know, understand the heathen, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's really so much of a smoke screen. Now, when you get down to your true scholars, the people that have been doing this for 20 or 30 years, and there's a handful of them that really know their stuff that are, that are really where they're supposed to be. You begin to understand that, when we start looking at this stuff, we've got to ask ourselves one question. So here we are walking along in life. Everything's going hunky-dory or it's either gone to shit. Pick one. It doesn't really matter. We decide, hey, I'm going to pick up this set of beliefs and I'm going to start living life like this. Okay. Now, in the middle of that, I come across some tidbit of knowledge. Oh, well, Goldbeg is Freya. Okay. Odin burned her three times. Well, what? Yes. Yeah, so what does that do for your life if you know that? How does the knowing that this idea, this misinterpretation, this completely wrong idea that Goldbeg is Freya, that Odin burned her three times and created a war? Because that isn't what it says at all. And quite frankly, if we just look at it like that, I don't find any kind of impetus for me to live the kind of life that would make me the example that I want to present to my family, having made this radical decision to live a radically different life than what everybody else is doing. See, everybody else is waiting on someone else out there to do it for them. And here we are grabbing hold of these nine noble virtues and all this other stuff saying, I have the responsibility for my success. I will endeavor. I will show generosity and hospitality. I will be courageous. I will demonstrate honesty. Those are pretty hard, tall order to live up to. Walking around thinking, well, Goldbeg, Freya, Odin burnt Freya and started the war. I don't find anything in that, in that simple concept, other than somebody trying to be edgy and cool. And it bothers me. And so I, I thought about it for a long time. I mean, I didn't just jump into this and say, wait a minute, y'all are all, all wrong because I, I have this messianic overtones to everything I write. I think I know what I'm talking about. It goes a little bit more than that. So when I look at all of this, I just look at the Volusma. I take it just for what it is. And when I look at it, it says right there, they're, they're in the golden age of, of Asgard. In their dwellings at peace, they play, well, forges they set, they smithied ore, tongs they wrought, tools they fashioned. Of gold no lack did the gods then know, till thither came up giants made, giant mage three, huge of might out of Jotunheim. And then it stops. There's an interpolation. There's a, you have to realize is that this stuff is, hundreds if not thousands of years old 
and somebody right in here may have left off at this part of the night and picked up in the morning and said, well, I'm going to put this in here, and it really doesn't tie anything together. So we're kind of stuck with just that at the end of it. We don't really get any kind of understanding of who are these three giants, these three giant mage, three huge of might out of Jotunheim. Well, if you go to Heindelgoth, you have this, uh, you have the short Veluspa, which is yet again, another version of it, another copy of it. And it names them. It says Hyth and Hrostioth, the children of Hrimnir. Now Hrimnir, you could look him up. There's a lot of names, but in this instance, it simply means a giant, a Jotun. So Hyth right here, meaning witch, and Hrostioth meaning horse thief. That's an interesting thing to understand. Now things begin to clear up for me a little bit when I get all further down in the Veluspa. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay, we got Goldbeck. She's gonna get burned. But there's two other characters with her. It says three maids, huge of might out of Jotunheim. So I got three giant maids that come in here, stirring up shit, <coughs> showed up in Asgard's golden age. And it says, the war I remember, the first in the world, when the gods with spears had smitten Goldbeg. Okay, this is when it starts. He'd smitten Goldbeg, the lover of gold or gold drink. And in the hall of horror had burned her, three times burned and three times born, often again, yet ever she lives. Now, the war has nothing to do with this action. And I'll show you why further on down. But it says, Goldbeg was smitten, this love of gold. Let's say you've built a great golden city. And these three hoes show up out of Jotunheim. One's a lover of gold. Think the Kardashians and you'll get the idea. One's a lover of gold. She just loves the gold. She ain't gonna do shit for it. She just loves the gold. And Odin tries to burn this out of his kingdom and rightfully so. We don't need that kind of, not everybody in here is doing what they're supposed to be doing. They understand their role. They make the sacrifices. They become what they're supposed to become. And this broad shows up, it's just a lover of gold. Now, the other one, it goes here. Hyth, they named her, who sought their home. The wide-seeing witch and magic wise. Minds she bewitched that were moved by her magic to evil women. A joy she was. And that has nothing to do with Freya. Neither one of those have anything to do with Freya. And yet every time I turn around, I see that interpolation and that discussion as if it's common and understood knowledge. And yet, if I look at that, I say, well, what good does that do me? trying to live this life. Well, it doesn't do me any good. But if I look at it in this way, that this lover of gold, this gold lover, this height, the bewitching of men's minds by gold, and the cross thief, the horse thief, the one that, inter that interferes with the ability of men to work together with the fields, the animals of the field, and each other, and I see a pattern growing that, that really resembles the destruction of society. And I also see that in myself. Now, if I can identify that kind of stuff, well, I just want that. I just, that's what I love, this gold lady. Or this, my single-minded focus of becoming nothing but rich. What will you sacrifice to do that? You can listen to, there is one man out there, and I love listening to him talk, but he's got one thing that really drives me crazy. He's adamant that there is no work-life balance if you want to be successful. As if that success, now listen, if you bring a child into this world, your responsibilities are gonna shift. You might not make $50 billion. You have this gift. And what people seem to forget when we look at these children is many times we're all they've got. Now, am I gonna let the love of gold bewitch my mind and rob me of the ability of teamwork to work with my spouse to raise this child? Because that's the only thing that really matters. Because at the end of the day, after you're dead and gone, the only thing people are going to judge what kind of man you are or woman you are is the quality of people your children become. If you're focused on the bewitching, the love of gold, or the inability to work with each other, what's that child going to look like? What kind of attitude are they going to have? Hell yes, I would have tried to burn that out of his kingdom. So there's something I need to pay attention to there. And a lot of it has to do with the, with the kind of Stevie Nicks, witchy woo woo kind of woman, kind of edgy with Freya and all this kind of damn nonsense that drives me insane. <laughs> to evil women, a joy she was, kind of, there might be an edge to her. But when we look at it, 
On the host his spear did oath and hurl, then of the world did war first come. The wall that girdled the gods was broken, and the field by the warlike wains was trodden. So there's a couple of things happening here to Odin. One of the things that Vanir asks is, should worship belong to one, or should it belong to all? So you've got these three giants made that show up. One is the love of gold. One is the bewitching of men's minds by gold, the witch. One is the horse thief, the inability of people to work together. And then out of the blue, this other group of gods show up and say, wait a minute, shouldn't it belong to all? It sounds almost like those communist socialist manifestos where everyone gets an equal piece of the pie. And Odin's sitting here saying, look, you bunch of jokers, I built every bit of this and you people don't get a bit of it. And he throws a spear, he loses his temper, he loses his cool. He demonstrates that side of our personas where we lash out and it is entirely unbecoming of a king or the one who should rule us all. So when you look at it in that manner, now all of a sudden we're looking at the, the, if you look at it on our personal lives, we get confused. We get distracted by the shiny rocks. We get uh, distracted by keeping up with the Joneses. And we lash out when we, there's a threat to our ability to keep up or keep our ego intact or look as good as we think we should look or be as important as we think we should be. And then Odin lashes out. And we all do. We're gonna lash out at those people that are a threat to our ability to look cool. And when we have all made the decision to change the dynamics, the spiritual foundation of who we are in opposition, a 180 degree different direction than the rest of the world, that's a real powerful vulnerability we just showed everybody. Are we gonna lash out with righteous indignation? Are we gonna cast that spear and start that war to justify who we are? <laughs> Odin's answer was to go wander, to sacrifice himself on, to himself on the tree, to pierce himself in the side, stick himself in place, to hear the songs of his ancestors and all of that good stuff. See, when we look at it in that term, now I've got the foundations of something that might help me move forward more than just thinking that Hythe means the shining one or the witch. Is it Odin trying to keep out those ideas that are not productive, that are envious, that are jealous? Listen, if you're a lover of gold, it's going to be very hard for you to be generous and demonstrate hospitality. It's going to be very hard for you to open your doors because if you're bewitched by that gold, there's always a threat of somebody going to take something from me. See, that's how all politicians work. They generate that fear that, well, if this person gets elected, you're going to lose some of the free shit the government gives out every day. <laughs> that's how they stay in office. <laughs> when I look at the Lord, when I look at any of this stuff, I've got to ask myself these serious questions. How does this benefit me in building my faith? Because when I look at Freya, I got a different answer than someone that should be burned at the stake. She is, as it says in the Gilfagening, it says Freya is most gently born. Well, why would Odin be burning the most gently born? This goddess of abundance, who is the daughter of Niord, who is one of the people that the Vanir sent at the end of that war. Why would he be burning her before the war? Why? So I got some issues with that. She is wedded to the man named Odin. Their daughter is Snoss. She is so fair that those things which are fair and precious are called Nasir. Odor went well on long journeys and Freya weeps for him and her tears are red gold. That's where we get our Baltic Amber. Freya has many names and this is the cause thereof that she gave herself sundry names when she went out amongst unknown people seeking Odor. She is called Mardul and Horn, Geffen, Seer. Freya had the ne necklace Brisingamen. That is by some accounts, the fires of human intellect, because there are few things that inspire men than the passions of the heart. The greatest poetry, the most wonderful stories, the most wonderful works of art, the grandest cathedrals, the grandest structures, castles, all of that stuff men would do for a woman that might smile at him. Wars have been waged and nations have been raised so a man might seek the, the love of a woman. The Brasinga men, Jim, the fires of human intellect, I think they rest quite comfortably around the neck, around the neck of Freya. She's also called the Lady of the Vanir. 
So we have this, this gentle born whose offspring are fair and precious, who governs abundance and prosperity, love, and has a home for half of the fallen warriors. I don't buy it. So I take a real great issue with that because I don't see anything that allows me to move forward. I can look at a lot of academic research and I have to ask myself, what good does knowing that do for me to build a faith that I might be a worthy example for my children? And children are probably the most important thing we have. What, what good does knowing that do according to someone's academic research if I can't put that into effect to kind of recognize my own shortcomings and grow and become a better person. What good does knowing that do if I can't implement that into the world that I live in today? And as wrong and as screwed up as people might think that it is, right now, we're pretty comfortable people. We can look all day long at what's going on in politics. Men created politics so they could focus on something to control their own destiny so they wouldn't have to fool with the gods. And when you get tied up in that and then call it religious, you lose something in that. You find yourself operating with nothing but righteous indignation and a fear of loss. So when I look at Freya, I find a goddess that inspires young Otter to go seek his heritage after he has built his faith. I find a goddess that carries about her neck the fires of human intellect, the great and wondrous canvas upon which so many beautiful things, works of art have been created in this world. I find the source of a goddess that, hey, we didn't always know that intercourse led to a baby. For a long time, it was a blessing. You've gotten a blessing from the gods. Freya was one of those goddesses. That cat's whooping your butt, Lori. I see it. That's funny shit. So when I talk about children and we start looking at all of this and we start looking at how do we, how do we deal with this? <laughs> See, that was a trial for Odin and one that he failed at and he had to go learn to correct it. He lost his temper. There was a threat to everything he thought he was worth because of what he built by three huge female, female Jotuns. Women are powerful creatures. Don't ever forget, there's two rules of life. Nothing good happens after midnight. Women are powerful creatures. If you can understand that, you'll do pretty good in the world. <laughs> so Odin's got to fix a couple of things and this is why I love seeing reading this lore because we find he's got to go fix even though the seeds of destruction are already planted in his kingdom and then three all-powerful female Jotuns kind of poisonous thought process enter the kingdom in a golden age why would there need to be a love of gold why would there need to be the bewitching of men's minds for gold well, it's so abundant, why would you have to do anything to get it? Golden Age created weak men, and those three female yokes are the representation of it, and he tried to rid his kingdom of it. He lost his temper. He went about it all wrong, tried to burn it out. You're not going to get rid of that. <laughs> and then the communists show up saying, hey, oh, we should, worship should belong to all, not just one, which was basically the message of the Vanir. But in but it all has to do with our ability to walk through life, but more importantly, it has to do with our ability to raise children or be that example for other children, maybe not even our own. And at the end of the Bach, the new book that I just wrote, Truer Bach is Icelandic for Book of Faith. Much of what I've said throughout these videos, I've put in that book, and, it, and I've gone in much more detail than what I just talk about here. Um, you wouldn't believe how much writing's involved in somebody that talks for an hour. <laughs> but I added to it and it came out pretty good. And somebody's, and there's always going to be somebody say, well, it could have been edited better. <laughs> the reason I don't put a whole lot of emphasis on that. If you read a book from the 1800s, it's going to read differently than the book you read today. And yet you're going to find that there's something in there you want to learn and you're going to pay attention to it and you're going to figure it out. Those are the people I want to work with. I'm not interested in working with the people that are going to split hairs and try to figure out some way not to see what's been written. And people may find all kinds of fault with that. I don't care. I don't want to work with them. <laughs> I got some good things to say. I got some good things that I've written. This Truerbach, this book of faith is a pretty good example of all of it. 
but I said, I will read some of it right here. And it talks about that image. So if I buy into this nonsense that Brian's talking about, what's that image that I'm going to have? What am I going to look like? What will I become if I set aside some of this righteous indignation that's made me feel like I'm pretty important? What will it look like if I agree that, you know what, Odin lost his cool. He had to go take a good long look at himself and get rid of some of those aspects of his ego, which cost him his kingdom. See, I don't know how many men have been through that midlife crisis or how many women have been through that midlife crisis, but I'll tell you right now, it's a destructive son of a gun. And you re pretty quick, you either figure out there's some things you've got to get rid of if you're going to keep moving on and become something, or you're going to hang on to them. And I could be like one of those guys sitting down there at the beer bar, the damn South Forte, sitting down there at a beer bar at 10 o'clock every morning when it opens, having a beer, meeting all the other guys that kind of give up on life. Are we going to become something? See, we will all go through many trials in life. Tough times may seem like they'll never end in the midst of them. Our thoughts govern so much more of our ability to navigate even the darkest of depressions or the tightest moments of anxiety. And that's kind of what I'm getting at with this discussion on Freya and Odin. See, we've made it through those tough times again and again. And every time we come up on one, usually it's because of our own thinking. We start this struggle, this cycle that we're used to, that we're comfortable with. And we made the radical decision to bust the foundation of our faith and create a new one. And yet we're very reluctant to change the cycle of our own thoughts. Even though we have example after example of gods that did just that to, for us to emulate. And what's it look like? because they all got burned up. They all got their asses killed. They screwed it up so bad that the slow working poison finally worked through there. That's the cycle of things. We have all approached this idea with the, this faith, with the idea and hope of something better. I mean, every one of us said, it's almost like that song. If there's a new way, it better work this time. I love that old tune, Peace Sells. <laughs> Our gods and ancestors have shown us by their actions not so much their words, but their actions, that we do indeed have what it takes to take control of our lives. There are people all around us every day, there, and they're printing money every day at the U.S. Mint. How much of it we want, the quality of life we want, the love of it, it's all up to how we think about it. And we got to figure out what part of ourselves are holding us back from doing that. And see, the real truth of the matter is, we may never get where we think we want to go but that's also a part of the cycle of things. There's so much potential with that idea of inaction in our lives that we can hardly comprehend it. So what does it look like when we quit finding other things to become upset about in our new faith? Well, there's an image of it, and it's not a very long image, but it is there. It's at the end. Then said Gangleri, shall any of the gods live then, or shall there be any earth or heaven? Because that's the real question of the day. What will I look like if I let go of all the things I'm supposed to be outraged about? What if I let go of all the pain I think makes me important or worthy of attention in someone else's eyes? Because that's what a lot of us are working on. I saw it most effectively done last year, about this time. <laughs> Matter of fact, well, it was in January. I was standing in a Dollar General waiting in the checkout line. A lady walked in, and I've said it before, and I'm not probably never stop repeating it. Another lady behind me said, hello. The lady didn't say, hi, hello, screw you or nothing. She said, my husband died just before Christmas. Oh, you poor thing. So immediately she was the recipient of all of this attention. She didn't have to lift a finger to get it. She was simply the victim. What happens if she let goes of, lets go of that? she just be a widow. Will she be important? What a real scary thought. What will I feel if I am no longer anxious about every waking moment? And what people think, will I still be important? Is there some kind of divine in my life? If I let go of the self-imposed sense of struggle, so common in social issues? Well, our answered. In that time, the earth shall emerge out of the sea and shall then be green and fair. Then shall the fruits of it be brought forth unsown. Thy darn valley shall be living inasmuch as neither seed nor fire of suture shall have harmed them. And they shall dwell at I to plant the gathering place where Asgard was before. And then the sons of Thor, Modi and Magni, shall come there, and they shall have Mjolnir there. 
After that, Balder shall come thither, and Hoder from hell. Then all shall sit down together and hold speech with one another, and call to mind their secret wisdom, and speak of those happenings which have been before, of the Midgard serpent, of the Fenris wolf, and then they shall find in the grass those golden chess pieces which the Aesir had had, and thus it is said, in the deity shrines shall dwell Vidar and Valley, where the fire of Surtur is slackened. Modi and Magni shall have Mjolnir at the ceasing of Thor's strife. In that place called Hodmimir's Holt, there shall lie hidden during the fire of Surtur two of mankind, who are called thus Leaf and Leafresir, Life and the Love of Life. That's why I named my book Leaf and Leafresir, Life and the Love of Life. And for food, they shall have the morning dews. From these folk shall come so numerous an offspring that all the world shall be peopled. Even as is said here, leaf and leaf are seer, these shall lurk hidden in the hold of hold mimir, the morning dews their meat shall be, this are gender the generations. And it may seem wonderful to thee that the son shall have born a daughter, not less fair than herself, and the daughter shall then tread in the steps of her mother, as is said here, the elfin beam shall bear a daughter, ere Fenris drags her forth, that maid shall go when the great gods die to ride her mother's road. But now, if thou art able to ask yet further, then indeed, I know not whence answer shall come to thee, for I never heard any man tell forth any greater length the course of the world, and now avail thyself of that which thou hast heard. Once we begin to let go of certain self-sabotaging ideas given to us by others, our perceptions of the gods themselves change. The sons of gods and goddesses lead the way into a new far green horizon. When we let go of those self-sabotaging ideas, when we let go of those things that keep us from becoming what we want to become, there is something indeed much greater, much brighter, much stronger that comes behind it. Balder is that wonderful example of the central part of everything. He is that shining sun, equal, fair, justice, all of those beautiful things. There is something magnificent that emerges when we begin to get rid of those things. Burn it up, get rid of it, let it set it on fire, get it out of your life. Stop those thought processes that keep you from becoming what you want to become. Where we might reminisce about our past and chuckle about the mistakes of our life as we have seen our grandparents do laughing at their failures and smiling towards the sunset. Sunsets they know they will see fewer and fewer of as their life nears an end. Our children will lead the way into this bright future. But right now the battle is ours. To relinquish patterns and old behaviors we have given a fresh coat of paint. Our children will be the ones who recognize the best of changes within us. That example of who we should be in our families. They will see it as the sun shining brightly on the promise of their future. Thereupon Ganglary heard great noises on every side of him, and then we had looked about him more. Lo, he stood out of doors on a level plain, and saw no hall there and no castle, as if by a dream. Then he went his way forth and came home into his kingdom and told those tidings which he had seen and heard, and after him each man told these tales to the other, Gangleri started this story because he lost a big chunk of his kingdom for a night's pleasure with a woman, with a wandering woman. He got suckered, he got bamboozled. He lost his head and lost half his shit. So he had to go searching, just like we're doing now. He had to go searching. He had to see through all of the magic, all of the wonderful things he saw, all of the confusion. He had to ask the questions. He had to learn. He had to know. That's the road we're on now. And in all of that, one of the great answers that we're going to get is what to get rid of. What are we free to set ourselves free of? What are we free to become? Can we let go of it now and become something more? Our children will see this, and they will tell others of the power of these old gods and how it made in their moms and dads so much better people. That is how we ensure a future for the descendants of the ancient tribes of Northern Europe with love right here in our own homes. That's what I got for you guys on this Yule, and I hope you enjoyed it. Anybody got any questions? Because that's some deep shit. <laughs> Everybody got boots? <laughs> I just I wanted to bring up the part you were talking about your book there, and I did get it, and it's really good. So it blow your lips off, of won't it? <laughs> it's really good, and I'm, I'm going to put a recommendation out there for you guys that are on here, or if you watch this later, um, 
it's probably one of the best things to be reading right now. Like I really do feel like that. So if you get a chance to pick up a copy, I would definitely do it. I know it's, I have both. I had the electronic copy because I have a problem with patience. You know, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> but they're really worth having. So Thank I wanted you. to make I sure appreciate that, that man. That means a lot. I can say it all day long. People just chalk it up to Brian being arrogant. Somebody else <laughs> says it, it means something. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a paid for advertisement <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right yeah it's, it's true it's but true <laughs> that last part that i read that that's right out of the book i mean that's what the whole kind of book is about those kinds of things but but that's i mean that was the drive it's been the driving force for so much of my faith i mean i look at these i'm at the point now i open up some of these books that everybody talks about and i just i see the same old shit and i'm like damn man i need to figure out how to stop being fucking lazy or i need to stop learning I, how to stop being a dickhead i need to figure out how to get up and go to work and hold a job like a regular person I, i'm not special i've done screwed it up two or three times in my life what do i do now so i changed this faith and it's an easy thing to do it's an easy thing to do to change the foundations of your world and grab a hold of new faith and find something else to be fucking mad about and man, I ain't got time for that anymore. I ain't got time for that. I'm 49 years old. I got an, I got an eight year old little girl. When she's 20, I'll be 60. So there's a time frame here. I got to get some things right. And I ain't so good at it. So I got to keep reading this kind of stuff. I got to keep studying this stuff. I guess, and that's, Army has a real simple program for people that want it. For, you learn it, you teach it, you, you, you learn it, you do it, and then you teach it. So I'm, that's kind of what I'm doing. And that book is a prime example of it. And uh, that's, that's kind of what, that's the motivation in all of it. I mean, I, I can sit down and study them books and be more right than the next guy. But man, I look at them, I can't hardly read them anymore. I read the first two or three pages and I'm like, and, and it, I find myself second guessing the decisions I've made. <laughs> so, there's just not much of it out there anymore that I, that I, that I pay attention to. And that, I know that's arrogant, but and if you've been in the fuck up as big as I have, <laughs> you, you, there ain't a lot of time for screwing around. You know what I mean? That's just the honest truth of it. It's like t getting in the gym and tearing a peck. I mean, that ain't something that's just that wasn't the smartest move. But I will tell you, I tore a hamstring one time, and uh, and that hurt too. But that's a funny story. I was at a quick trip and I was about to get into a, a fight and I was about as strong as I am. I was stronger then than I am now. I wasn't tearing a pack mentioned 345, but I take off running towards this car and it's like a little, it's like one of those race cars they race on the highway and it was real small and light. And I thought, I bet if I hit that car hard enough as a cannonball, I can get enough momentum. I can flip that son of a gun. So I take off running across the parking lot as fast as I can. I am fixing to tear this little car up. I know I can pick the rear end up off the ground. It's going down. As I'm running full speed, pop, a hamstring goes. I come down. I roll an ankle. I land on the other knee. I tumble in a, like a pile of shit across the parking lot. Peals of laughter erupt across the, erupt from that car as they take off. And I hear, I hear, Brian, you're an asshole from the person I'm with. And they drive off and leave me. So I'm laying in the parking lot, wounded, doing the low man crawl over into the weeds, crying, trying to call a cab. <laughs> That's just kind of how it goes. So this is, this is standard stuff for me. <laughs> Make, see, so when I'm reading this lore, I'm trying to find an answer to keep me from doing that kind of stupid shit anymore. So I think I've come a little bit a long way, and I just did this in the gym in like a legitimate setting, and that's just kind of how it goes, guys. <laughs> it's just the reality of it. I used to be a, a turd, man, and some days I still am. So, but Freya is not gold vague. You may say it's different. You just tell them you're, they're wrong, and I'll get a big kick out of it. <laughs> anyway i gotta go that's um, people are calling me i gotta see what's going on but if anybody has any questions i'd be happy to talk to you about it no thank you brian all right thanks guys i hope you all had a good night and 
Hey, enjoy your holidays, man. We got some time off. Let's relax. Let's rest. Let's recuperate. Let's uh, let's just find the time to be, and look at our children as they open their presents. And if we can remember, you know what? We're all they got. It, it changes everything. It changes everything about what we think about our children. And it's just it's been the most wonderful thing for me. Anyway, I appreciate it, guys. Have a have a happy Merry you, every one of you. Mary O'Brien, thank you. You bet, you bet.